God not only caused the rain to fall from heaven, which man had never seen before because the earth was usually watered by a mist that came up from the earth. But the Bible said he caused cisterns of the great deep to give up their treasure. There was water stored in the earth that nobody knew about. So when it got ready to flood, the water came down from the heavens for the first time, but the fountains of the great deep were broken up and water came up from the heart of the earth and flooded the earth. So the, to flood the earth, God merged water from the heavens and waters that were concealed in the earth whenever he got ready to flood the antediluvians. And the Bible said in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Nobody knew about those fountains of the great deep. What I'm trying to say to you right off the bat is God has things that you know nothing of and that I know nothing of. Let me show you an interesting scripture. It said in Job, where is the way to the dwelling of light and where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to it home? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, God asked Job, or have you seen the storehouses of hail, H-A-I-L, which I have reserved for the time of trouble the day of battle and war? Now look at this. This is so interesting. That's in Job but now I want to take you to the book of Revelation. Let me, let me back up just a minute and read this to you one more time. God said, have you entered into my storehouses where I keep the snow? Well, how in the world does he keep snow in storehouses? It must be pretty cold there. Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, H-A-I-L? Well, it's interesting in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period, that the Bible said, and great hailstones that weighed as much as a hundred weight, 150 pounds, that was a talent, great hailstones dropped on men from heaven till men cursed God for the plague of the hell. So fearful was that plague. Now back in Job, God said, have you seen my storehouses where I keep the hell stored? And in the book of Revelation, he taps into that storehouse when he needs it and it rains hailstones on men during the tribulation. How does God keep those things, and where are they? And the answer is, we don't need to know. All we need to know is we know. <laughs> That's all we need to know. Amen? And God has things stored that we know nothing about. When God gets ready to do something, he has inventories and things stored up in places that you can't even begin to imagine. He commands them to open, and blessings and provisions start manifesting in every direction. When God gets ready to move, things that he has laid up that you know nothing about can come from all directions. It can come from the Christian community. It can come from friends. It can come from even enemies. It can come from the north, south, east, or west. It can come from those that hate God, even evil. You know, the Bible said in the days of Elijah that he commanded the ravens to feed Elijah. He didn't command the doves to feed Elijah. Ravens in the Bible is known as an evil bird. When God gets ready to do something, he's got all kinds of sources, and you don't need to judge his sources, just receive from his sources. <laughs> God is not limited. God's not limited whenever he decides to do something. He's got all kinds of stuff. Only thing, the only problem is with us is we want to see it, and you don't need to see it. He's not going to let you see it. He's just going to tap into it when you need it. Amen. And the Bible says this, and I love this, Jesus speaking. He said, I've got to work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. Oh, what did that say? Let's look at it one more time. It said, I must work the works, Jesus said, of him that sent me while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. 
What he said was, no man can work, but God can work. It's saying that no man can work. There comes a time that you can't do anything, but God's got all kinds of resources. He can do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it, and whenever he wants to do it. You might not can work, and that's the place God loves to get us, is where we can't work, and God said, now just sit back and watch what I can do. And when God gets ready to work, he's not bound by adverse conditions. He's not bound by the benefit of somebody giving him a helping hand. He's not bound by the environment. When God gets ready to work, he doesn't need anything or anybody when God gets ready to work. He can bless you in the presence of enemies. He can bless you in the presence of demon, bull, demon spirits. He can bless you in the presence of witches and warlocks. He can bless you in the presence of threats. He's God. Nobody elected him and nobody elevates him. I want to tell you something about God. He cannot be toppled. He cannot be impeached. He cannot be removed. He can never be defeated. He does his good pleasure when he wants to do his good pleasure. And there's not a thing anybody can do about it. Now listen to this. Before he was God and before there was nobody around, before the angels ever sang, before there was an earth, before there was even a hallelujah uttered the first time, before the sun ever shined, before a wave ever crashed on the shore, he was God and he already had these things stored up with you in mind. God's got things you know nothing of. Quit looking at inventories that you think are going down. God's inventories never go down. They are never depleted, never. So God does some of his best work at night. Oh, that's where I've been trying to get to now. I've been trying to get to this scripture right here. God does his best work at night. Now, you might say, I don't believe in that because the Bible says there's no shadow of turn. Yes, it does. It says there's no shadow of turning in him, but God does his best work in the dark. Not talking about spiritual darkness. I'm talking about just darkness where nobody can see. I'm going to show it to you. Now, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And look at this. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what happened when there was darkness? It caused the spirit to move. Y'all hear me? If darkness was not good here, the spirit could not have moved not unless God told it to. But when God put everything in darkness, it initiated the moving of the Holy Spirit. So God saw that the light was good and he divided it from the darkness. He called the light day and he called the darkness night. So the Spirit moved in the darkness and upon the darkness. So really... One of the first things I want to get established in our thinking this morning is that God usually moves the most powerfully in the darkness. Now, the Spirit prepares things in the darkness. When the command is given by God, it will expose what the Spirit has been doing in the dark. I want to show you an interesting scripture. I've been trying to get to this one all morning. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Whenever I'm going through H-U-L-L, do I need to spell it here or can I say it? When I'm going through hell, I always remember this scripture. Here's what the Bible says. Listen, God called the night, he called the light day and he called the darkness night. And this is so interesting to me. The evening and the morning were the first day. Have you ever thought about that? If I was God, which I'm not, but if I was God, I would start about daybreak. When the sun's just coming up. 
God starts when the sun's going down. You know why? Because he does his best work in the dark. Oh, come on now, help me. Y'all help me a little bit here. And the Bible said, in the evening and the morning were the first day, and then he separated the firmament from the waters, and he divided the waters from the waters. And then the Bible said, God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay, so here's what happens. What is about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock called? It's called afternoon. 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock rock. I mean, no, no, I'm sorry. (laughs) But anyway, anyway, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, that's the afternoon. But the evening is when the sun's going down. So the Bible said the evening and the morning were the first day. So in other words, when God gets ready to do something and he really wants to show off, he'll put you in the dark first. I said, when God really wants to show off, he'll put you in the dark first. So listen to this. A lot of times when people get a prophetic word from God, they don't understand they're about to go into darkness. Why? Because God is going to give an evening and a morning first. Let me give you another little revelation. Let me give you another revelation. Okay. Whenever it's 12 o'clock midnight, it's still dark, but the new day has already come. Is that resonating with you? So when God gives a new day, ding dong, 12 o'clock at night, it's a new day already, but it means it's already been evening (coughs) from about seven o'clock or eight o'clock till midnight. And so you might think that the new day would dawn at midnight and the sun would come up at midnight because it's a new day. No, you still got darkness to go. So here's what I want to, <laughs> here's what I want to tell some of you. Your new day has already dawned and you just don't even know it. Midnight has already come up. There's a new day already and you just hadn't figured it out yet. But the sun is going to come up in just a few hours and God's going to show you what he's been doing for you in the darkness. Can you shout amen? Amen. So, the evening and the morning when God starts something, he starts it and leads you by the hand into the darkness. When you are about to go into whatever God's promised you, when you are about to go into whatever's been prophesied to you, even your church, even things to do with you or your ministry, things to do with your family, things to do with you personally. A lot of times when God gets ready to do a new work in your life, he's going to lead you into the evening and the sun's going to be going down. And when the sun goes down, darkness comes. That's when God does his best work. You know why? That's where you got to trust God. So let me explain to you what I'm talking about. Let me give you a little bit further picture here. Whenever a woman's pregnant, are you pregnant back there? Whenever a woman's pregnant, look here. The seed of man has fertilized the egg of the woman. And when that happens, conception takes place in the dark. Listen to me. There's something that's going on in that female. The height is being determined in the dark the height of the individual. The color of the eyes is being determined in the dark. The hair is beginning to grow in the dark. The heart starts beating the first time in pitch darkness. The baby starts moving the first time in pitch darkness. You know what birth is? It's coming to light. It's coming to light. So here's what I would like to say to you. When you're in the darkness and God has birthed something in you, it's all being determined 
how long it's going to take. It's all being determined what it's going to look like. It's all being determined where God's about to take you. All that's being determined when it's pitch dark. But whenever it's birth, you know the church has got to get back into the birthing business. We've got to get back into birthing of intercession and birthing what God has promised to us. Somebody shout amen. amen. Woo! When that baby comes out, everybody says, oh my God. He looks just like his daddy. Oh my God, look at that. Oh, isn't it precious? Isn't it precious? But when you're carrying that baby and you're vomiting every morning, it ain't precious. Can I tell you sometime whenever God's birthing something in you in the dark, you're going to be throwing up, you're going to be sick, you're going to be miserable, you're going to be thinking, I wish this was over. It's not over. There's yet to be things formed in the darkness that's not ready for the light just yet. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? I'm not going to preach long, so y'all better help me. God holds that baby in the womb for nine months. You know why he holds it there? He's careful not to bring it out of the darkness too soon because the baby will be able to overcome if he holds it in the darkness a little longer. But the baby can't overcome until it stays in the darkness long enough to build up its resistance to what it's about to face. Sometime God will put you in a dark place Don't worry about it. You may be thinking, oh my God, why do I feel cut off from things? Why do I feel like God has left me? Why do I feel like everybody else is excited and I'm stuck off? I'm sorry, I can't feel anything. I don't know what the world's going on. God's keeping you there because he's developing something that hadn't come to light just yet. And let me show you something else. God took Adam in the Bible, put him to sleep, and put him in a dark place. And when Adam woke up, there was a woman there. And here's what Adam said to himself. I didn't know that was in there. You know what God will do when he puts you in a deep place? He'll put you in a situation where when you come back to and the light shines, you'll say, oh my God, I didn't know I had that in me. (laughs) I didn't know I had that in me. I didn't know I could preach. I didn't know I could prophesy. I didn't know I could sing. I didn't know that I could play an instrument. I didn't know what God was doing in my life. But when you come out of it in the darkness, recedes and all of a sudden the light shines there's a woman there and you say I didn't know she was in me you don't know what's in you until God puts you in a dark place for a while you got stuff in you that you don't even know is in you there's stuff deep in you You don't have any idea what's in there until God puts you in a dark place. You know, a lot of times you take a car. If you don't get the oil changed in that car, how many of you know this is probably going to be a problem? You can't just add oil to your car all the time. You have to take it in and get an oil change. You know what they do when you get an oil change? You pull your car in. And you tell the service manager, I need to get my oil changed. I need to get my tires rotated. I need to get the oil filter changed. And so what happens is they cut your engine off. They put it up on the rack. They take your keys out of the ignition. They lift your car up like that. They break the little oil thing down, you know, below in your oil pan. They drain all the oil out. They drain it to the last drop, all that used oil. The engine's still off. They put your car back down on the ground, screw the little cap back on, and then they begin to pour fresh oil in. And when you pull out, you're ready again for another five, six, seven thousand miles. Amen? You know what God does to you a lot of times in the dark? 
he takes the keys out of your ignition and hoists you up and drains the old oil out of you. He's draining the old out before he can put the new in. I said, God will drain the old out of you before he can put the new in. I remember before revival broke out of Brownsville, we'd been praying. We prayed two and a half years for revival and broke out on Father's Day of 1995. And we'd been praying two and a half years. It was really something. When we first started praying, it felt like it was going to happen any minute. I mean, you know, we were fighting the devil. We wasn't fighting the devil. We were fighting devils, plural. You name it, we fought it. And by the time we started fighting those demons, we said, yes, revival is about to break forth. But as time went along, things got darker and darker. As time went along, it felt like it would never happen. When we first started praying, it felt like it was about to break forth any minute. So the moral of the story is this. If you're praying about something and it feels like it's about to break forth, it probably is not. (laughs) There's darkness yet to go. But if you're praying about something and it feels like that it's about to happen, that it, it just feels like it'll never happen, it's probably right at the door. If you're praying about something and it feels like it's time to give up, it feels like it's time to throw in the towel, it feels like it's just time to walk away, it's never gonna happen, it's probably right at the door. That's when you need to be the most persistent. That's when you need to get back in there and go again seven times. That's when God is about to give you the miracle you've been praying for. I remember real well before revival broke out. Am I all right? Okay. I thought you was fixed to do something with my leg there. <laughs> I remember before revival broke out, it was amazing. We started praying. It was like, oh, praise God, this is awesome. But we kept praying, and it just, everything just sort of leveled off, and, you know, it became sort of perfunctory, sort of became just sort of routine, to the point, and we were still praying. Now, we never quit praying. We kept praying. Brenda, I had 12 revival banners. I had one for souls. I had one for divine healing. I had one for uh, leaders of our country. I had one for schools. You know, just I had 12 prayer banners. If you prayed five minutes around a prayer banner, it was, if you prayed five minutes around 12 of them, it was 60 minutes as an hour. Brenda had the revival banner. And so we prayed five minutes on Sunday nights around the prayer banners, and then it got to where we was praying more than five minutes around a prayer banner. We was praying sometimes 10 to 15 minutes around a prayer banner. Church was learning how to pray. And then the prayer meeting began to go from like an hour on Sunday nights. It began to go like two hours and, and more. We had communion every Sunday night. Communion is the bread of presence. It means common union. Communion means common union. Every Sunday night, we'd come and enter into common union with the Lord, common union with his sufferings. And then every Sunday night, after, before we got ready to leave, we would pray for people that was going in the hospitals for surgery. We would pray for people going in for tests and that kind of thing. So Sunday nights, when I first started praying, it was a major warfare. But there at the end, oh my God, it was, it was rough. It was rough. I mean, we kept praying. We didn't, we didn't back off. Sometimes God's watching you in the dark to see how you're going to take it and see how quick he can bring the light. Some things have to be formed in the darkness. And so I got to the point I was not discouraged, but I felt like that, I felt like, well, I believe the time's come for me to move on. So right before revival broke out, I picked up the telephone as the pastor of Brownsville. And I didn't know in a matter of about six or seven weeks, revival was about to break out. It was going to touch the world. And I'm calling district superintendents of the Assemblies of God, asking them if they have any churches open. Because I feel like that it's never going to happen. You know what I was going through? Evening without the morning. 
I was still going through the evening. A new day had already dawned. Midnight had already come. But you know, the darkest part of the night is about 4 a.m. before the sun comes up. The sun was just about ready to come up, but at 4 a.m., I'm calling district superintendents, asking them if they got any churches open. I wonder what they thought seven or eight weeks later when major revival broke out and God was touching the world. They said, I just talked to this guy a few weeks ago and he was trying to leave. You know why I was trying to leave? Because it was still dark, but oh my God, when the sun... When the sun comes up, everything makes sense. Everything makes sense. I said everything makes sense. Listen to me, listen to me. Don't ever leave in the darkest part of the night. That's when the devil's trying to pry you out with a crowbar. Listen, there's some things you can get out. You can get a nail out of a board with a claw hammer, but you can't get a screw out of a board with a claw hammer. It takes a crowbar. You got to get that centrifugal force. You got to get that inertia. You got to put that crowbar on that screw and you got to pry it out. It takes a crowbar. Some things take a crowbar. You know, the devil has been so used to working on us with a claw hammer, that's worked for years. But I'm telling you, we're in a time right now, he can't take a crowbar and get me out. Why? Because I know what's dark right now is going to be light in just a short period of time. I'm staying. I'm sticking with it until the day comes. Somebody shout amen. And then Father's Day came. Now let me tell you something about darkness. Sometime the darkness will hold on to the last second. I remember me and Brenda went out with Steve Hill and Steve had preached for me so many times at Brownsville and um, they'd given their story there. You know, Jerry, his wife, she'd been the product of a rape. She had a real rough childhood and him, her and Steve got married and God used them powerfully. Steve was always a powerful soul winner. He was always a souls guy. Always had that passion, you know, had them bright blue eyes and big old eyes, you know, and he always had that passion, full of passion and full of anointing and always loved souls. Me and Brenda went out to Red Lobster with him on Saturday night. I didn't want to go. Brenda was excited about it. I had Steve at my church so many times. He had preached there so many times. It was always good every time he came, but my mother had just died. And my mother had just passed away and I loved her so much and she paid a major price to see her boy in church And she had just died, and a prophet called me before she died, and he said, Brother John, I just want to give you a word from the Lord. And this guy was a credible prophet. He said, the Lord said, when your mother's gone, it'll come. I said, what will come? He said, when she's gone, revival will come. So when she died on May the 7th, what's today? May the 7th. Dates are important. When she died on May the 7th, five weeks later in June on Father's Day, revival broke out, just like the prophet said. But so me and Steve and Brenda went to the Red Lobster and Brenda was so excited because she'd been touched powerfully in Toronto and Steve had been powerfully touched in Holy Brompton. I hadn't been touched at all. I was sad. I was discouraged. I was beat down. My mama died and left me. (laughs) And so we went to the Red Lobster and oh my God, it started before we even ordered. Brenda went, and see, and they were, what God's going to do? Oh my God. We hadn't even ordered yet. I said, wait a minute. The waitress needs to get your order for heaven's sakes. <laughs> so <clears throat> when, the, when the waitress walked, 
And it started, and I'm just sitting there. I'm so out of touch. I'm dead as a doornail. I love my mother. I'm grieving. And I just, man, I'm in the dark. And so we got through that night, and Brenda got in the car, and she said, wasn't that wonderful? I said, it was hilarious. (laughs) So I went home, went to bed, went to sleep. Now it's Father's Day. I wake up on Father's Day morning. Revival is about to break out. What we've been praying for two and a half years. Come on, y'all help me now. Been praying for this two and a half years. Okay, I wake up that morning. I'm more depressed on Sunday morning than I was the night when I went out with Steve and Brenda. I think it made it worse. And I woke up, and the first thought that hit my mind was, I'm not going to church this morning. I'm not going to church this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my staff take the service because Steve's preached here so many times. He, they can introduce him. I'm going to stay here. I don't feel like going. I don't want to be bothered. I want to I wanna be melancholy. <laughs> so they had a little girl in the church. She loved me dearly. Her mother left her, left her and her dad for another man. So this airman in the Navy, he was an officer. He was raising this little girl by himself, but she loved Brother Kilpatrick now. She wouldn't go to children's church. She wanted to come in there and hear me preach on Sunday mornings. And she'd always run as soon as I got through and wrap her arms around both of my legs and look up at me. She said, I love you, preacher. <laughs> well, that morning I'm laying there and I said, okay, I'm not going today. Well, in January of every year, we always voted in a mother of the year and the father of the year. Well, her daddy was voted in the father of the year. And so I saw in my mind her coming up and running, grabbed me by my legs. And, I love you, preacher. And I said, shoot, I got to go to church. I got to go to church. So I got up, got dressed, went to church, didn't want to be there, got out of the car, my body language, my shoulders were slumped. I, my, my face was sad. I didn't have any life in me, no passion in me whatsoever. And I walked in, and there's Steve. He can't be still. Just couldn't be still. <laughs> so we got out there on the play, on the stage, and you know it was good that morning. The place was packed out. It was Father's Day. We had about 1,700 people there that morning. It was really good. Everything was good, but I just standing there, you know, I just didn't have nothing. I had nothing. I had nothing. I'm spent. So... I got up and introduced Steve, and so whenever I introduced him, I'm walking back across the platform, whispering under my breath, now I can sit down and they'll leave me alone. So he got up to preach. And Steve's always been, you know, a powerful souls preacher. But he got up that morning, he said, I'm not going to preach long, I have two parts. He said, the first part is, Jesus loves you. And I thought, that's deep. So the second part is he has a plan for your life. And I thought, okay. <laughs> so he got up and started preaching. <clears throat> and he was just like somebody plugged him into a 220. Not a 110 or 220. He couldn't be still. He just couldn't be still. So in just a minute, he said, if you want prayer, hurry, come forward right now, hurry. And out of about 1,700 people, there was over a thousand gathered down below for prayer. I was so cotton picking mad. I said, well, thank you very much. Happy Father's Day to you too. Now we got a thousand people to pray for and it's Father's Day. They need to go home and have lunch with their dad. And here we got to pray for a thousand people. Thank you, Steve. I didn't tell him that, but I felt that. So I remember I walked down off the platform. I, I, I sat on the platform and watched him for a long time. And I got to feeling guilty about it because I thought, well, what's my church going to think about me letting the evangelist pray for everybody and I'm not doing nothing? So I got to thinking about how things looked, not because I cared about anything. Hey, y'all hold it down over there. 
so <laughs> I got up and I said, well, I guess I better go help him. So I walked down off the stage. And when I walked down off the stage, when I walked down off the steps of the stage onto the main floor, I felt something <laughs> like a whirlwind. And I thought, my God, the air conditioner sure is strong this morning. <laughs> I thought, wow, the air conditioner is strong. And I thought, well, and it's low too. It's down low today. But I felt air going up my britches legs. I felt air going up my britches legs. About socks, you know, just went past my socks. were coming right on up. I thought, oh, yeah. So I remember. I remember Steve was praying for this guy. He's about six foot eight, six foot nine, big old tall guy. I'd never seen him before. And Steve walked up to him, and I walked up to him and put my hand on this guy's shoulder, and I put my hand on Steve's back like that. And, uh, man, it was, it was really going up my pants legs by then. And I could barely stand up. My legs started quivering like this, you know. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with me? See? And then he moved on, and I tried to move on, but I couldn't pick my feet up. I couldn't pick my legs up. It's the first time my body didn't do what I told it to do. And he moved on down the line, and I watched him, and I'm thinking, what is wrong? John Kilpatrick, you can't even walk. And about that time, a guy that got saved under my ministry on Easter looked at me, a big old burly guy. He used to be a bouncer in a bar, and he looked at me and said, hey, man, you okay? I said, I don't know. I can't walk. He said, here, let me, I said, help me back up on the platform. He said, yeah. So I put my arm around his shoulders, neck and on. He helped me up on the platform. I couldn't even lift my feet to walk up the steps on the platform. He was up basically dragging me. And I remember when I stood there behind that platform, uh, that pulpit, and I grabbed the microphone, and by now it's dawning on me, daybreak. Daybreak. A new, a new day has dawned. A new day has dawned. The darkness is past and the light has shined. The sun has risen. Oh, 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 oh. come on, give him praise. I feel that right. Oh, what? Come on, church. My God, have mercy. Well, he said, then I said, I grabbed the microphone and I said, oh, church. See, got my eyes open now. Just six or seven weeks ago, I'd call and see if they had any churches open. It was pitch dark. It was already a new day dawn. Midnight had already come, but it's about one or two o'clock in the morning. And I called and said, I think it's time for me to go. See, don't ever start reasoning in a dark hour. Can I say that to you again? Don't ever start trying to make decisions in dark hours. Hold tight. Darkness may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I said, joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, here's what happened. I said, oh my God, church. I said, this is it. This is what we've been praying for. See, my eyes is open now. See? You see, when I woke up that morning, when I woke up this morning, and when I saw, I just said, well, I'm not going to church today. And then I saw that little girl come and hugging me. And I love you, preacher. See, my eyes hadn't opened yet. I was in the birth canal. But when I got on the platform and I couldn't walk and he helped me up there, all of a sudden now, everything came together. And I opened up my eyes after I come through that birth canal and I could see everything clearly. See, let me tell you what happened. <clears throat> so I got there and I said, if you want prayer, 
come forward. And so the place just filled up with people. I didn't know it, but see, we were, they, we had, we was on radio live. And so people, I didn't even think about it, but people were hearing what was going on in the church live all over Pensacola and Escambia County, Alabama, Mobile and all that. They were listening live. And so I looked and I said, this is it, get in. And I looked and there was a guy that I loved and he was, he was a, a fine man. His mother was a Pentecostal preacher years ago, but he was a real dignified guy. He owned a steel company. And I loved him and he loved me, but I never saw no movement out of him. And I was there 13 years before revival broke out. I came in 82 and it broke out in 95. And I'd been friends with him. I never saw him spiritual in any way. And so he's standing in the aisle right in front of me, <clears throat> about halfway up. He's one of them. And I said, the Lord's here. And I said, just receive in the name of Jesus. And I mean, it was like somebody was up in the balcony with a Gatlin gun, machine gun. And it's like somebody was over there with a machine gun. And when I said that, it was like they just started cutting people down down below. No music, no nothing. People just started dropping like flies. He dropped to the floor. And I'm thinking to myself, you never did that with me when I preached. And he dropped in the floor and started rolling. See, he's now like a Baptist, but his mama was a holy roller and the holy roller won out. <clears throat> so that was one of the last, last sights that I saw before God put me in the dark again. Because when I saw that, can I tell you a funny story? Brenda don't like me telling this part, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. She's not here. There was a woman nursing her baby and the baby was just having lunch. And so mama was standing up down there to get prayer with the baby having lunch, but the mama had a little blanket over her, you know. The mama fell out in the spirit, <laughs> but the baby never missed a lick. <laughs> it's the truth if I've ever told it. <laughs> I mean, finger looking good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> See, what happened was that morning I woke up and I was still in the dark. How many of you knows God can keep you in the dark to the last minute? Listen, don't think for a minute you may see it coming. God specializes in fixing things where you never saw it coming. Just be faithful. Could I say that again? Because after I'm gone, I want you to remember that statement. God fixes things many times where you never see it coming. He keeps it until the very last minute. And when I got on the platform that morning, it was only then that it dawned on me that God let that man be voted in as a father of the year God had it fixed that I would wake up that morning and I would say, I'm not going to church today, but I saw that little girl in my mind. That happened last January because God knew on Father's Day he was going to pour out his spirit. He had it all planned. What God does in the dark will come to light. I said, what God does in the dark will come to light. It'll all come to light. It'll make sense. God will fix things and everything will make sense. Well, I got to close. Amen. Well, how does God have things fixed to where things perpetuate themselves? How does he have things fixed? He has it fixed that seeds must be put in a dark place before they'll germinate. Seeds have got to be put in a dark place. They can't do it in the light. They've got to go through the metamorphosis in the dark. So you see, seeds were engineered by God in his thinking and in his planning. 
They were designed in God's mind to go back into the dark place before they can become what they're meant to be. Before you ever eat that watermelon, that seed had to be put in a dark place. Before you ever eat that corn, that corn had to be dropped into a furrow and covered up, buried. Before you can eat a peach, that seed had to be buried in a dark place. The dark place is a requirement. The dark place is a prerequisite for the development of a harvest. Ooh, could I say that one? That, I, 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 I felt something when I said that. I said the dark place is a prerequisite for the development of a harvest. Some of you have sowed some seed and you're wondering what in the world has happened. Just shh, be quiet. It's about ready to come forth. Amen. <clears throat> it is. You need to thank God that he allows us to go through these metamorphoses in private and not before everybody. Uh, let me say that again. You need to thank God that he allows you to go through your metamorphosis, your change, in private instead of before everybody because if you could do it before everybody, they would talk you out of your harvest. God likes private things. He does his best work in the darkness. He only lets others see later what he has made us to be, but he didn't let them see what he was making us to be in the dark place. Some of you right now, I speak over you in the name of Jesus that you're in a dark place and you're almost upset about it. You're sad about it and you're almost to the point that you're upset with God about it. But the Lord has sent me here this morning to tell you, relax. This metamorphosis that's taken place in you is not quite finished just yet, but it's almost finished. Where you are is not where you're going. And there's treasures in that darkness. And the Lord says to you, don't be afraid of the dark. There's riches in hidden places. A teacher, a boss, a lover, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a coach, a parent, grandparent, a psychologist or a psychiatrist may have told you that you don't have what it takes to be successful, <clears throat> that you don't have what it takes to be prosperous and responsible. They may have told you and diagnosed you that you're ADD. They have told you that you're ADHD or that you're bipolar. I got tickled at one guy one time. He didn't have any education, was riding along in the car. And he said, you know, preacher, he said, I got married. <clears throat> and he said, I love that woman. But he said, she's got that Marco Polo disease. <laughs> and it took me a minute to figure it out. He meant to say she had bipolar disease. <laughs> <laughs> He said, she's got that Marco Polo disease. And I thought, oh yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yes, sir. <laughs> but you see, what I'm trying to say is God's developing what's underdeveloped in you. And he may take you on phase two of it later, but right now he's going to take you out of it and let you see the light of day. But he may take you on phase two later and it won't last as long, but he's still making something out of you. Amen? Let me, uh, let me close. I'm having to skip some pages here. Don't y'all wonder what was in what I'm skipping? Let me, let me just close with this. <clears throat> I have something at the very end I wanted to close with, but time's getting too late. Let me, let me close with this. The two greatest events in the world happened in darkness. When Jesus hung on the cross, it was but the sixth hour of the day. And the Bible says, 
In verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness all over the land. When Jesus died, he died in darkness. When they took his body down from the tomb, they put it in a grave, and the Bible said they rolled a stone over the sepulcher, a cave, pitch dark inside, pitch dark. And on the third day, a light hit it, and the stone was rolled away, and angels were sitting on the stone, and Jesus emerged. And the Bible said when they went in there to see where he lay, you remember they said, come and see where the Lord lay. You remember the angel said that to him, y'all come in here and see where the Lord lay. The Bible said that that handkerchief was folded neatly and laid in its place, and he did that in the darkness. You see, don't get so frightened in the darkness that you can't remember to leave good signs behind you <laughs> to let other people know it's not that bad. <laughs>